I'm going to speak through this microphone for the translators. Va bene? Okay. Um, my last name, as most of you understand, is Italian. I'll get the usual question out of the way. Where are my people from? They're from Bari. Okay? Stop <laughs> it. All right. What I, I also would like to, to, uh, to, to thank the uh, committee that organized the meeting for taking an individual who's not a surgeon and having him talk to you. And I hope that, that you'll find a little bit of uh, wisdom from the, uh, from the talk. Uh, when a pain doctor begins to conceptualize what is the source of, of the pain after surgery, we have a tendency to do it as this, is that you have either, either intraoperative damage to a nerve, and this becomes either a neuroma or deaffrontation, and there is also the possibility of entrapment neuropathy. As my friend Henrik Kellett is going to show you, you may possibly have no pain after surgery and then over time develop an inflammatory reaction to the mesh. And that would be a third reason to have, uh, to have pain. We conceptualize it this way because that guides us as to how to potentially treat the patient. And we have two options. We can either stabilize impulse generation or conduction, and this is obviously pharmacologic, or what we can do is we can attempt, notice the question mark next to diagnostic nerve, not diagnostic block, we can attempt to localize an involved nerve and then to perform some type of temporary neurolysis using either cold or using either heat with the radio frequency procedure. This is a mechanistic approach on how to use pharmacology in order to treat the pain from herniography uh, if it's neuropathic in origin. And this can also be a, uh, this is the typical type of pattern that a neurologist would use in order to treat typical neuropathic pain. And so let's go over it. I believe many of the comments of Henrik and myself can be reduced to this type of a, a discussion. Simply because we're worried about a peripheral sensitization to a nerve. This is the peripheral nerve that is down the relationship of that peripheral nerve to the dorsal horn neuron, and this is in the spinal cord. And I will show you when we talk about the distinctions of brachial plexopathy versus what you're de dealing with, you'll understand the rationale a little bit, a little bit better. And then we need to do about the descending modulating systems. These are endogenous agents via opioid, such as enkephalin, endorphin, uh, whether it's noradrenaline, okay, or whether it's serotonin, and these will then feed down to the level of cord and stop this neuron from firing. So, mechanistically, what we have is a peripheral nerve. It can undergo what is referred to as sensitization. And sensitization means that its rate of firing will increase, and it also means its rapidity, the number of action potentials that are generated over a specified period of time, also increases. If a peripheral nerve can, this, this, yeah, if a peripheral, this is off. Gotcha. Okay, so it's okay. It just keeps going on and on. Okay, thank you. If a peripheral nerve can sensitize. So can a nerve in the spinal cord, so can a nerve in the thalamus, so can a nerve in one of the major relay centers in the midbrain. Most of the time the problem above the spinal cord is in the thalamus. But a spinal cord neuron can also sensitize, it can also increase its rate of firing, and it also can increase the number of action potentials that are generated. It is then the interplay of the descending systems to whether this neuron is going to fire uh, much or not. And the individual drugs that affect each of these three different processes are different. In the peripheral sensitization, you usually have drugs that affect sodium channel conductance. The classic ones, phenytoin, dilantin, car ox car uh, carbamazepine, tegretol, tricyclic antidepressants, newer ones such as oxcarbamazepine also. The ones that affect central sensitization are gabapentin, pregabalin, 
oxcarbamazepine, but also NMDA antagonists. These drugs will mainly affect calcium uh, conductance. Other drugs will affect N-methyl diaspartate receptors. And then, obviously, drugs that are going to either increase noradrenaline or serotonin, and these are the older tricyclic antidepressants, and the SSRIs, the serotonin-specific reuptake inhibitors, and the SNRIs are going to affect the, uh, the spinal cord neuron from firing. The, as surgeons, you know that at, with respect to the three nerves that we're discussing today, genital branch of the genitofemoral, the ilioinguinal, and the iliohypogastric, that you may resect, you may cut the nerve, and nothing is going to happen. And what I want to talk about is the process of diaphrontation pain. In other words, you cut one of those nerves and something does happen. And the pain that you may or may not get is worse than the problem that you started with. So let's talk a little bit about the affrontation pain because I was taught uh, that you never sacrifice a nerve. You never cut a nerve, you never destroy a nerve. What I was told was wrong, but my professors were well-meaning. So I will also give you a little theory as to why at times you can, you can cut these nerves and resect these nerves. What I'd like to do is to talk about the process that is called deaffrontation. Deaffrontation, by definition, means that there is some damage to the transmission process. It is usually associated with some type of anesthesia in the area. That is why it is referred to in older textbooks as anesthesia dolorosa, painful anesthesia. And it is also associated with spontaneous pain in the same area as the anesthetic. In other words, I just brush my finger lightly on the area and the patient will jump and it will be extremely severe. There are two mechanisms by which this occurs. Remember, we talked about the peripheral afferent, the primary peripheral nerve. We talked about the dorsal horn neuron. Here it is again. If I cut a peripheral nerve, I then can get a active uh, set of areas wherein impulse conduction begins to occur. And this is at the area of the transected nerve, and it occurs also at the area of the dorsal of the dorsal root ganglion. There is another mechanism wherein, and this, is, this occurs with, as a good example, brachial plexus avulsion, where the nerve is ripped away from the spinal cord. And this is where the nerve is ripped away, the nerve is essentially destroyed in whole, and the dorsal horn neuron begins to fire at an increased rate and uh, increased action potentials. So, what I'd like to do is to compare brachial plexopathy or brachial plexus lesions with perhaps some of the pain that you might see that would be neuro neuro neuropathically induced. And so the mechanism, as I said, is of two types. You can stretch a nerve, and I would propose watching some of the, the, the films today, that there is injury every now and then to a nerve because these nerves are being stretched during your procedures. This would be akin to the lesion of a peripheral nerve. 